Welcome to the Scale with Pros podcast with your host, myself, Cody Barton, the number one place to be if you want to build a business beyond yourself. And for all the resources we talk about in the show, make sure to head over to scalewithpros.com. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and dive in. I am here with Kyle Mack, the founder of Junk Rescue, a local company to, to me here in Arizona, and somebody that I've watched from, from afar on, on his entrepreneurial journey, you know, over, you know, the last few years and, you know, seeing him, you know, from starting, uh, starting up his business to continuing to grow and scale. And, you know, I, I couldn't think of, you know, a, a, a better person to, to bring on the show uh, than, than Kyle with, you know, specifically, you know, a lot of people, obviously listeners are in this position where they're in that solopreneur stage. They're trying to go from solopreneur to, you know, more of the entrepreneur of having a team and having a business rather than just owning a job. And so, you know, Kyle, I definitely want to dive into some of that today, but um, I, I'll let you share a little bit on, you know, tell us, you know, this, this journey you started, uh, Junk Rescue uh, <clears throat> Company, you know, when, when did it start? Um, you know, how, how many years have you been doing this? You know, what does your team look like and, you know, revenue range for, uh, for the company to date? Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, thanks for having me here, Cody. I really appreciate it. I've been following you for quite some time as well. So really cool to see your growth and what you guys have done too. And yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to become better like every business every single day and obviously grow our team and our systems. We started, um, back in, uh, early 2018 with just a simple box truck. Um, the concept was essentially my family comes from a construction background. So I always grew up on job sites and, you know, helping them clean up or drive the Bobcats or whatever it was, you know? And so, um, kind of in high school had the idea pondered on it of just like, I I wonder if people would pay for, you know, them to have their stuff removed from their home, you know, their stuff that they just don't want anymore. Um, kind of pondered the idea, put it out there, ended up starting to sell real estate with two of my best friends in high school, outside of high school, after we did community college, did that for quite some time. And then they ventured off and we're starting to kind of create a business. And I had this, you know, aspiring from the past. So I was like, you know, it might be time for me to do that too. And I'm, I'm glad I did. I got into the market before things today are a little bit more saturated, a lot more companies that offer this, but junk rescue is essentially a full service, um, junk removal, dumpster rental, and demolition wrecking company in the state of Arizona. So anything waste related, um, we want to be a resource to you, whether that's, you know, as simple as you ordered a new couch and you want to get rid of the old one, we'll send a team in, pick up the old couch for you. That way, when new couch comes, old couch is gone. You don't have to worry about it. Or if, you know, you need a dumpster container for doing, you know, renovation or remodel work, stuff like that, we can put a container on your job site so the crews can fill it. Um, and then maybe you own a construction company, you guys are really busy, you don't want to deal with the demo work, we can send a full scale team in there and rip out all the drywall, the flooring, the kitchens, the bathroom, refresh it so it's ready for the contractors and trades that are coming in. So pretty much anything waste related where we're removing something or taking it away, that's what we specialize in. That's essentially our industry. Love that. So. So you've been building this up since 2018, obviously time of recording now, 2024, you know, yeah. what's, what's the team look like today? You know, obviously yeah. it started with just you and you know, what, what just are some of those? Around. Yeah. It's like, you're, you know, making the sale, going yeah. out there, picking up I the mean, stuff, taking it to the up. dump or whatever, you know, and then doing the next one. <laughs> those are the good days. And you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll jump in, we've started to pick up more accounts that are reoccurring accounts. So sometimes I'll jump in on those just to kind of see what's going on and, and get feedback from the clients and stuff like that. So it is, it goes to show you how fit you have to be to do this stuff. Cause I'll do it for a day with the guys and I'm gassed by the end. <laughs> and I haven't been doing it as much, but um, yeah, our, our team is in giant. We have four trucks that are on the road. So we have two dumpster hook lift trucks that run. They um, run around 30 dumpster containers that they're always competing for, whether that's like drop offs, pickups, swap outs, stuff like that. And then we run, um, one Azuzu NPR junk removal truck that runs around the valley just to pick up furniture, cardboard boxes, miscellaneous trash, stuff like that. And then our, our demo team varies between eight and 15 guys, depending on our seasons and how busy we are. So yeah, it's definitely scaled from when I first started. It was just me and a buddy going around and yeah. picking up jobs when we could and doing what we could to kind of just get work. And what, as you know, once you build your CRM and your databases and 
it gets easier to farm people and get repeat customers and reoccurring business. And now being doing this for six, seven years, we have a lot of that, which I'm thankful for customers that are constantly calling and needing the service again and again. So as you build, you just end up getting more business. It's like a landscape buddy told me a while ago when I was kind of first starting out, he's like, man, even if you want to turn the phone off and you know, don't want to, he's like, people are still going to call you as you start to build a brand and grow and people recognize it. You're just going to, you're going to get phone calls, whether you're really marketing or not. You know, thankfully we market and continue to brand and grow that way. But it's like, you know, when, once people realize you do a service and you do it well, they, they spread the word and they let other people know. So we're, uh, we're thankful for that. I mean, to answer your question, it's about a small team of six in-house and then, you know, varies out, out house, depending on, you know, how many employees we need for bigger wrecking work. And then um, right around a mil to a mil and a half per year. And then 30 roll off containers, like I mentioned earlier. I love that. It was yeah, so man. cool. Like, th- like, honestly, and, and, you know, part of the reason I do this podcast is like my favorite thing in the world of, you know, just like my passion, just like entrepreneurship and business and like just seeing it's like, from you know you and then just your buddy it's just like going around and finding just random jobs that you could to then it's like all right let's start professionalizing the business and like going through those stages and there are so many businesses uh that cannot go from that first stage if they just it's kind of just like a hustle you know and they call it a hustle because it's like there's no actual like system process behind anything they're just kind of doing the work as it comes right you know what what do you think were you know, what's, what do you think is that gap from you going through that, you know, the business owners that maybe they're doing a couple hundred grand a year or less, and it's typically at that size, it's just them and maybe one person helping them, maybe, mm-hmm. um, you know, what, what do you see is the gap to, from that to now, okay, you're at a million plus a year. Like, what do you think was the difference that, you know, you had to, to, to take, you know, what path you had to take to get there? What were some of those things that you had to, you know, I guess, optimize, whether it was technology yeah. or systems yeah. or people? Totally. Yeah. It, one was like uh, more so our software, being able to dump stuff in quickly. Our, our website is all integrated with it. So if someone goes in there, fills out a form, it dumps straight into the software stuff, just like cleaning up steps along the way. Yeah. And then obviously you know, hiring, you know, in my industry, it's a lot of driving. And as you add vehicles, like I can only drive one, you know? So at the time it was like, I'm, it's not as scalable as I'd wanted because I need more drivers if I want more trucks. So that was like, okay, Hey, I got a good number two in place. And he was able to really help me build like, Hey, if we hire someone, what's the whole training packet look like from the first day they're here to, you know, the 90th day when we do a review with them. So it's like, that kind of cleans it up. It gives them a, a, something to follow, a guideline. And then it also helps us tell our story to the employees to get them on board with the vision. Like, hey, this is what we're going after. This is our brand. Because in reality, we are a home service, like waste removal business. But I preach to guys, I come from the hospitality industry before, you know, real estate. And I'm yeah. like, hey, whether you're doing waste or HVAC or roofing, no one can replace a really solid handshake, like good customer service skills, being able to educate the customer. That's what's crucial. So a lot of the training is that with my guys, like I tell them, Hey, picking up the junk is pretty easy, but it's about engaging with the customer, getting a solid review, you know, being able to really explain the story and and just create that connection with them. So for me, it was kind of like, all right, how do I put this all on paper so that as more employees come in, I can explain to them, Hey, this is our vision. This is our story. You either align with it or you don't. And then it kind of, it puts in a good perspective too of like, Hey, they're going to work or they're not pretty quickly. So that was my thing is basically just, and for me being a visioner, I hate sitting down and like writing down every step, you know? And that's why bringing in my number two was like, great because I'd be like, like, for example, like we remove a lot of hot tubs. I was like, hey, we need to create a sheet on like the exact exact step from when we get to the customers till we leave on hot tub removal. He just bangs it out. He loves it. Yeah. You know, he's probably more <laughs> your style where I'm over here. Like it would take me weeks to do it because I'm just like, you hate I get doing it. Yeah, yeah, I hate doing it. I'll get a phone call. Cody Barton calls me. I, I want to talk to him later. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing that. So it's one of those things is, yeah, really get your systems because when you want to scale in volume, you need a team. You can't, there's, there's a threshold and dollar amount to where you're like, 
I'm overwhelmed. I can't do all this at once. And yeah. so I think what me it realized is like, I was getting so many customers calling that I'm like, okay, I can duplicate my position in a truck pretty easily and just add more trucks and containers. And then we can service a plethora of more people opposed to just servicing like a couple a day, you know? So that, that's kind of where I took it was like, let's map it all out, write it all down so that we can coach others on how to do this so that me and, you know, the guy that's been with me for a while don't have to physically do it all the time. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you've had the, uh, taken the time or had someone on your team that's been able to take the time to do that because there's, I'll tell you this, you know, I, I work with, and we've acquired businesses that are, you know, doing two or, you know, three, 4 million a year in revenue. And we're like, you know, what are their systems? And there's nothing. It's like no training, no nothing. It's like when someone gets hired, they just come in and they just shadow until they figure out how to make a difference at the company. And so yeah. <laughs> that's you're, you're dead on with that because I think where it clicked for me is we hired someone and I could just tell that like, you know, I was like, all right, what if I was them, you know, and this wasn't my business. And then like, they don't know anything. Like one of our dumpster drivers that has been here like a year now, he came from driving a car. He'd really never driven a truck. So I, I mean, our trucks are all under CDL. They're easy to train on obviously, but now mm -hmm. he's like an expert on it. But for example, like someone like him comes in, they're just kind of like, it's new to them. They don't know what's going on. It's like, okay, well, I got to put myself in their shoes and make sure they have a plan to follow and like a guideline and, and some documentation that they can educate themselves on the business on their own time. Cause otherwise I feel like, you know, there's already a plethora of big companies out there that have systems and organizations. Those employees are going to go work there because they know, Hey, I have something to bank on. I can read this. I can rely on it. There's a system. People that are employees tend to like that better than people like us that are entrepreneurs and might just wing it and thrive in chaos. Yeah, exactly. If I told Cody, Hey, we're going to have a crazy day, come along, do this. He'd be like, sweet, let's do it. You know, an average employee might be like, okay, what's the plan? I need to know like so they, cause they want to do it right. You know, yeah. and so they want to follow something for you. Otherwise they feel like maybe they're not doing it correct. So that was just my thing is like putting myself in the employee's shoes to like give them perspective. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of things to unpack from what you're just sharing, like some tangible takeaways for people is that so so for people listening that are wanting to scale and grow and, you know, go from that couple hundred thousand to a million plus a year. A few things that I took away from from you sharing that, Kyle, is basically one is, you know, caring about your team like that's it's a no brainer to me but you know for someone listening they're like you can't just like hire someone and throw them into the role and hopefully they figure it out like it's not going to work out that well so one caring about your team enough to to give them the resources resources to succeed a second piece that i took away from you sharing that too kyle is where you aren't the the person that loves to create the documentation and sops and those things and there's there's this excuse that happens sometimes when I talk to people that are like I'm more of a visionary and so yeah of course my business is unorganized it's not an excuse it's just you recognize where your strengths are and you find a who that can do the what because you don't need to be the one that's the expert in everything it's you need to be you know as an entrepreneur as the business owner you need to be competent enough to know that these things are important it doesn't mean you need to do them like for me i'm like i don't know how to do website development i don't know how quickbooks works besides how to look at my pnls and like do basic stuff in there but i have a cfo that knows what he's doing in there you know we have a web guy that knows what he's doing in there and so it's like that you know, that was another core, you know, piece from what you shared. And I think a lot of people get stuck and they either try to learn those things and just do it, even though they're really not good at it. And, you know, it's like you can find other people and, and in your specific situation where you're more of a visionary, you know, you can have, you know, you can hire an operations team member to help you or you can hire. There's process companies that do this stuff, too. Oh, yeah. There's, it's you know, I we've worked with them in the past where, you know, I, I like to say that I'm very process and operationally oriented like I am. I'm not great at writing them out like very well. Like it looks like a decrepit like, you know, mess of stuff, but it, it works and it worked 
But now, like, I look at, like, my head of operations, like, I'll give her, like, literally this is yesterday. We're starting a new business-to-business uh, -business outreach, you know, strategy. And so I like to be involved in new strategies that we're doing. And so I'm like, okay, what are all the things I want to have tracked in this and, you know, put this, you know, all the KPIs of what I want to see on, like, a weekly basis for the performance? And then I give it to her, and it's, like, this ugly spreadsheet that, like, I don't really know how to use Google Sheets that well. You know, I just know the basics. And then, like, you know, she starts putting stuff together, and it's like, da -da 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 -da, and it's, like, this beautiful thing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, you're so much better at this than I am. I know what I want, but, like, I'm not good at putting it together <laughs> yeah i mean it's crucial in business i think is just kind of finding a number two or like someone that like believes in the brand with you that you could for me like i guess in like constructions or trades or stuff guys are a lot quicker to like go get a new truck or get that piece of equipment where like <laughs> yeah. for me i'm like i love doing that too don't get me wrong but if you can get a number two or pay someone a good you know salary or like a good wage that is good enough for them to stick around and want to help build your brand with you like that's going to be your best bang for buck because it's all the stuff that we just talked about where you're like hey i'm not great at it yeah could i do it no i don't really want to and then i think once it'll click with people as they get it they assign the task and then the task comes back to them and they see it and they're like you just did this it's already done like for me, I would have been like, this would have taken me weeks because I would have just procrastinated it and not wanted yeah. to do it. But it's just about being able to delegate. As you grow a team and you can delegate more, you realize like, okay, hey, I'm not some like angel that fell from above that needs to do everything. Like hire for the positions that are people are capable of doing that you don't need to do because it's going to allow you to make bigger decisions and do you know bigger moves in life. If you're kind of doing the tedious bullshit forever, then you can't do the big deals. It just you won't you won't put yourself in that room. Just yeah, like you're just too caught up in the weeds. You know, there's uh, yeah. one of my favorite books I love recommending to people is Who Not How, and it's literally you know defining that it's like all the things have to be done, but just not always by you. You know, so it's like leaning into those strengths and you know finding the right people to help with those things. And and what you know I I've found this to be true in most states in America because I have a lot of friends and other you know, business owners in other states and other people that, you know, I help mentor in different ways. And yeah. besides maybe like California or New York, most states you can hire, you know, say like an operations coordinator role for maybe 60 to 70 grand a year or an operations manager role where maybe they're a little bit more seasoned for 80 to 85,000 a year. And you can get a lot of great work done from like that level of talent. And it's oh, like, you know, people think it's like you need to, you know, pay 200 grand a year to like solve all those problems. It's like you are, you know, depending on what you need, maybe 60 to $85,000 a year away from solving your problem to scale to that next level. Totally. Yeah. I mean, most of the time I, when you talk to entrepreneurs and I think I deal with it and I'm sure sometimes you, is we're usually the person in the way, you know, it's usually <laughs> you as an individual, like you're the one thinking, oh, well, it's going to be expensive or you know, oh, it just takes too much time. I can't do it. And it's like, dude, you're the one stopping everything. Like just put in some action and start to put forward with it. And they'll start to kind of steamroll. It doesn't happen overnight. A lot of people want it overnight too. That's one thing about entrepreneurship is like you talk to people and it's like, dude, you've been around like a couple months, like relax. Like you're, oh, you're, you're screaming at me and you've only been here a couple months. So it's one of those things, but it is. I mean, in entrepreneurship, I think it's easy to get caught in the weeds, like you said, and just like I've dealt with it and, you know, in the past and, and you know, as we integrate and build more systems and teams, I just try and, you know, I'll be like, oh, I could do that. And then I sit back for five minutes. I'm like, do I need to do that? And I'm like, no, I can assign it, you know, and I'm like, yeah. okay, assign it. And then, then it's great because then now like something like this comes up or an important phone call or, you know, a new deal and I can go do that, you know, and it puts me in a better position to like gain more business than I would have been stuck, you know, just doing something simple that is unnecessary. So hundred percent, just cause you yeah. can, doesn't mean you should, right? Like that's a, that's a, yes. that's a big thing. And it's you so funny, sayings, man. You're a reader like Jack. <laughs> Dude. I, yeah. I, I am an avid reader. I read every week for freaking years now. I, I love, I love it. But yeah, the, uh, you know, your comments on like people want, this like fast, faster success. And it's like, there's no real shortcut. It's just like the work has to be done and like the growth along the way of reading the books and, you know, implementing new things and testing new things, all of that has to happen. And I think, I think sometimes people see with, you know, like Instagram or social media, it's like, 
you know, it's like everyone's a multimillionaire on social media and it's like, you know, in 17 minutes and it's like, hey, swipe up. Like, let me show you how to become a millionaire in, you know, 20 seconds or less with, with, with no money and no experience. And it's like sometimes it's like not that healthy for, for people to see that because they get skewed on on yeah. these time frames. And I literally I, I had a call with a, a lady yesterday and she was she was venting to me and she's just like, you know, I'm not getting traction and da, 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 and like, I'm seeing what you're doing. And, you know, and she's trying to like do like four or five different businesses at the same time. And I'm like, stop, like you need to choose one and do one. And she's like, well, you're doing multiple businesses. I'm like, cause I have teams and systems and years of teams and systems in place and different companies. And that's the only reason that's possible. It's not that I'm special. It's because I have great team members, great systems and processes in those companies. Otherwise, it yeah. wouldn't be possible to do those things. And I think, you know, I, I just want to, I always want to continue to share that message of, you know, yeah. to people, it's like, Hey, it's not going to happen overnight. Like it's not a business isn't going to get rich quick. Like if you, like, it's just not. No. Yeah. My stepdad told me that early and uh, he is like, you, you know, you want to do your own thing, get ready to, you know, not take a paycheck for quite some time and put it back into the business and, you know, just be, be prepared to, you know, make payroll and do other things and put yourself last kind of deal. And so, it is one of those things too, where I tell a lot of guys that are kind of struggling on that is like, Hey, you know, one relationship can really change everything. A lot of people underestimate how much action they need to put in and guys in my industry will call me, Hey, it's slow. It's busy. I'm like, okay, Hey, uh, the 10 property management companies down the way, who are they? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm like, okay, well go to every single one right now and open the door and introduce yourself. Tell them what you do. Give them some information. I'm like, start there. I'm like, you need to go shake hands and like be face to face with people because that one guy could have like a hundred jobs for you. You don't know. But a lot of people are just kind of scared to put in the action. And so it takes them a lot longer because they're just kind of waiting for things or they're buying leads online. It's like, hey, it's good to have PPC and marketing and do all that stuff. But, you know, relationships, any good big job that I've gotten is through a handshake or a relationship or a connection you know, and so that's why I tell a lot of guys is like, get, get out there, you know, shake some hands, put your, put your face out there. hundred percent. And you know, it's actually, it's really funny that you're just talking about that. I, I, I made a post on Instagram, just like kind of venting about this this morning. Cause I, you know, I was talking to someone else the other day, um, in, in a business that, that we have and just around like the amount of effort that it takes to go and like drum up new business, like doing direct outreach. And I'm like, it yeah. literally, I was like the, I was like, you need to do almost a 100 times the amount that you're doing right now. Like that is the minimum uh, to get to what, you know, in this particular business. And it's like people underestimate the amount of action that you actually need to take to get the result. And, you know, so, so that's, I think a challenge. And I think to, you know, what your point was too on, you know, it's great to have these marketing channels going, but like going out and building relationships and like, you know, shaking hands, like there's multiple ways to get business, right? It's like, there's, you know, there's word of mouth, there's those referrals from past clients. There's, you know, obviously, you know, professionalizing your business, you're going to just continue to add more marketing channels. And as businesses grow, they typically do that. It's like, okay, when you're first starting, you're maybe focused on, you know, referrals, networking, and, you know, just getting business that way. And like, you continue to do that forever. And then as you grow, you just start adding on other pillars, but you don't want to be reliant on those. It's like, yes, do the PPC, get SEO going, you know, get, get Facebook ads going if it's relevant for the business model or Instagram ads going, you know, get local search going, you know, it's like all of those different types yeah. of advertising, you know, channels are great and they work, but you know, like, like to your point, it's, if those aren't working, you need to be able to know what you can go do to go and add on to the business and maybe some slower times of the year based on the business model. hundred percent. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say is not having all your eggs in one basket is kind no. of crucial because then, and for me, I like it because I'm out doing relationships, connecting, whatever, ding, you get an online booking from your website or you get an online form or like someone, you know, we just integrated e-commerce for our dumpsters. So people can literally like order a dumpster, like Grubhub, you know, just put their credit card in and boom. And it's like, Hey, orders complete. Dumpster will be there in 24 hours or less. Like that's good for us. Cause that's money into my account. Like right now, you know, yeah. so getting lead capture on your site. I'm always working with my website guys. Like, Hey, 
I don't want anybody to leave the site within the first, you know, 10, 15 minutes, put a call to action on there, something that can, you know, kind of make it stir up some sort of business, whether it's a contact form or a lead is crucial. And then back to my point is like, you want kind of all those avenues going because then you're like out networking, doing relationships, your website's working, you have your, your referral people giving you good word of mouth, you have your repeats calling. So then, then it really fills up the calendar a lot quicker opposed Mm -hmm. to like, Hey, we're just banking on like PPC (laughs) and it's like, we don't really have that much this month. And it's like, well, we'll just wait and we'll see if we get more. And it's like, it's not a good strategy. Yeah. And those, all those platforms, their algorithms are changing all the time. The pricing's changing all the time for how much you have to bid to win the business. You know, it's like, there's so much variability in it too. So it's just, you know, it makes it more challenging. Um, So, so something that, you know, prior to us, you know, getting started on the podcast that you had, you know, uh, you'd sent over a question in regards to, you know, what hire makes the biggest impact on a small business? I, I wanted to see, I guess, just if you could add in a little bit more context, if it's like, okay, certain department or at once you're at a certain size, just, just for the audience listening, like what's the context behind that? And then let's talk about it. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure you have some really good feedback on this too. For my industry, it was, it was my number two, just basically someone that could really do a lot of the things I didn't want to do also maybe take on integrations with like, you know, phone systems and like doing the invoices, kind of more like an office person that is like, hey, this came inbound and it's like gets emailed to them, you know, or it gets communicated to them. So that for my business was pretty crucial. Each business could kind of vary whether it's like CFO or like, you know, a main leader or a top manager or something like that. But for me, it was just a number two that I could trust and basically not share everything about the business with, but a good majority to help us kind of put us in a growth era and say like, hey, these are strategic plays I want to make that we're going to work on outside of the core day-to-day stuff. So like, here's your core day-to-day task. When you have free gaps, like we're working on this. So, and the thing is too, is I like getting guys that are maybe like an employee or like an entrepreneur, right? But then they kind of break into their like entrepreneur with me. You know, you kind of like, I've had guys that have with, you know, two, three years. And now I just can see that like they have more grit and they want that, like, you know, they understand the entrepreneur game and what's going on opposed to it was just like very like robot before. And it's like, dude, you know, like, come on, there's, let's have a little bit of play in here. Um, so for me, it was a number two, you know, for other business, I'm sure you have a lot of expertise. You have multiple businesses where you could say like, Hey, this one really good to get a CFO right away. Hey, this one, get a top manager so that we don't have to physically be there every day. So for me in the waste industry or maybe a small business, I would say just a reliable number two, Mm -hmm. you know, that that's, that's what I kind of tell people. So, so I would say this is that is true in most of the cases where you are the visionary role, right? So the, the thing I would say, like my actual answer on that is like, identifying, I think the most important role to get in the business and a small business is whatever your strengths are, listing those out, identifying what are your, you know, best strengths that you have in the business to help the business grow, and then list out the top weaknesses and like, what are those weaknesses causing? Like what, what harm are those causing to the business? Is it, you know, yeah. it's not getting enough leads because you're not good at marketing. It's not getting enough sales because you're not good at sales or if it's, you're not good at operations. So like you sell stuff, but all your customers hate you because like you're a freaking mess on delivery. So I think yeah. it's listing out your strengths, weaknesses, and then based off of your weaknesses, that's where the lunch pin's likely going to be. And then hiring based off of that. Cause yeah. like for me, like any business that we get into, like, I, I mean, I'm not ever really doing the sales per se anymore in anything, but like, I know I have to have someone involved in the things that I'm doing that's strong at sales and marketing because I don't really enjoy those aspects of business that much. I enjoy like everything else, but it's important that those things happen because I could have an organized business with all of these great you know, back office functions and all of that. But if we're not selling enough of it and we're not getting enough leads to sell, then yeah. that's a problem. So I, I think it's, you know, that's the true answer for someone listening is like, if you're, if you love and you're like Kyle, where it's like, you want to go build relationships, sell, bring in new business and, and, and work on just business development in that regard, you need to have that number two, like Kyle's saying to do all of the other back office functions plus operationally, 
you know, helping run the business. Um, but if you're, you know, maybe more like me and you're like, hey, I like doing all of those other things, but I don't necessarily love to market and sell, you know, that's something that you can, you could hire people to help do or agencies you could hire to help do those as well. And the thing I do want to say is like, if someone's listening and they're like, I'm just never going to do this thing because I don't like doing it. And it's like, sometimes like the caveat to all of this is like, sometimes you have to do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do in your business. So that's yeah. also important. I don't want someone to think like, I'm never doing that because I don't like doing it. It's just like, well, if no one in your business is doing it, you have to do it, but know that you can backfill that and have an agency or another team yeah. member help do it at some point. Yeah. It's like you mentioned earlier with like QuickBooks or like other stuff like that. Like, you know how to go in and do stuff, but you're, it's not your favorite thing to do. And I think no. as a business owner, it's important to kind of know each step and role so that you're kind of have some clarity and background on it. And then if it's not your you know strong suit, like Cody said, then be able to hire someone for that, but also being able to find someone. And then if it's not a good fit, you probably should eliminate them quickly because it's going to cost you more headache and probably put a bad seed in the pack. So get rid of it quick because, and that's a lot of people too. They want, they think like, all right, I'm going to hire for this spot and I'm going to get a perfect hire. And usually it doesn't happen like that. And so you might have to go through a couple people to find that gem, you know, with my situation, I was lucky. I knew this individual. I could tell they were deep in the brand. They liked what we were doing. So I was like, I gave them that opportunity and put it on the map. And they were like, yeah, I'd love to, you know, take that venture and opportunity with you, but don't assume they were like, Hey, these are the things I suck at. I'm going to hire someone and it's just going to eliminate all your problems. Usually not inside a business, you know, it just doesn't go that way. No, a hundred percent. And you know, I, what I've found is I'd like to say that, you know, between our companies, we're pretty good at hiring, but we still make mistakes. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if someone comes in and they don't end up working out and that's, you know, that's just part of it. And I think that's also a fear that some business owners might have is they're like, oh, well, like, I, you know, if they don't work out and it's like, well, sometimes it just doesn't work out. But you can't let that fear stop you from, you know, from trying and then, you know, making the mistake. And every time you hire another person and have to fire someone and have to do it again, you learn things. You learn, okay, what did I, you know, and that's the important part of it is like through that process, make sure you're learning. It's like every experience of hiring someone, firing someone, going through the process again, it's like, what are those things that you're able to learn to not hopefully make some of those same mistakes that you might have missed in the last, you know, round of interviews or the last hire. Crucial. Yeah. Very crucial. I would say we've gotten lucky too with like making good hires, but I think it also comes with your brand and like how you portray your business and image. You know, you know that, Hey, this is kind of our, you know, our stipulations. This is what we're looking for. So you're able to kind of weed out people before you even let them in um, through an interview or just kind of getting to know them for a short period of time. But yeah, it's like, you know, you might, they might seem great in the interview or the couple of days you meet them and then, you know, things happen in family and life and relationships and stuff. And it's just like, Hey, it's turned into a bad seed. Okay. Eliminate it before it gets worse. But I try and just keep guys that are, you know, core really bleed the brand. You know, they're here to, and I ask guys like, how, what is your intentions? Are you planning on sticking around? I'm looking for long-term, you know, employees with growth that want to, you know, have opportunities to rise in the brand. And if guys are like, oh, I'm just looking for like summer work, then it's like, you know, as a business owner, like by the time you train them and you go through this and you go through putting them on your insurance and yeah. do it, it's a huge headache yeah. for us, you know? And so being transparent, you know, when I first started, I wanted to just like, yeah, I'll give you an opportunity or I'll hire here and do this. Come and on that. in. You have a, yeah, you have and a heartbeat now, and you're willing to work. Come on in. Oh yeah. Now it's like, you know, Clint, like he's my number two. He'll be like, Hey, we got a, you know application like you know and i'm like ah not right now you know like you can just kind of weed things quickly opposed to like being in that boat where you're just like yeah try everything you're like no like you said earlier like learning is huge like a lot of people are like well i failed and like business isn't for me and it's like no you didn't <laughs> fail like you're just learning it's like a relationship you know like a girl be like this is the biggest you know it was a waste of time you know and it was like not really i learned what I didn't like, and you learned what you didn't like. So we kind of learned something from the relationship and now we go on and meet new people or whatever it is, whether it's business or, you know, um, husband and wife or boyfriend, girlfriend type of thing. But there's always something to learn and take and do better on the next one. Not like, you know, Oh, it's a failure, you know? Like, yeah. hundred percent. And, you know? and I mean, all the failures in business are just learnings. Like those are all like you spend money on an ad campaign doesn't work. Okay. Now you split test it differently. Oh, now you found the winning one. It's just like, that's just, 
all businesses. I'm sure, you know, there's certain things that you found in your business that maybe there's certain uh, types of junk removal or things that you do that are more profitable. And it's yeah. like, okay, I'm focusing more on that because it's more profitable. Well, is, yeah. what, were you failing because you were doing the other thing that wasn't as profitable? Well, no, you're learning what was the thing to focus more on, you know, just all, yeah. all learning. Yeah. It, and in our industry, it happens a lot with like building equipment and stuff like that is you'll, we, I talk to the guys in industry is like, it's always the next truck. You know, you're always kind of like improving to be like, Hey, this truck was missing this to make it go faster for the guy when he's doing a swap out or whatever. And so it turns into like, you're kind of just always progressing, whether it's like systems in your employee handbook or like the next truck that you're going to build, it turns into like, Hey, how can we make it more efficient and more effective? Because we didn't really know we tested this one and it works, but we want to get better and faster. So like, let's do this on the next one, you know, and that's just business. That's how it goes. You know, that's why I love it. I'm obsessed with the process and like kind of going through the entire deal, usually with like a bigger, like demolition wrecking job or like getting a new account or something like that. I like to fulfill the process and, you know, update the customer and show the progress and then get a, a final result. And like, they're excited and they're happy. That's where I get my juice. You know, a lot of people that are just maybe chasing the dollar, it doesn't end up really working out for them because they just like, they can't see all the shit in the middle that they're missing. You know, that maybe, Hey, that guy, why did he get the job instead of me? And he's like, dude, he's a lot more detail oriented. He preps everything off. He puts plastic down. Like his crew is dialed. They're all wearing company swag. Like it just is more official. Like he cares more. You know, and it's like, that's why you're not winning. You don't care enough, brother, like put in some more effort, you know? And so I think in entrepreneurship, like it's not for the weak. You need to, no. you need to care. You need to have some effort and like want to win. Otherwise, like if you're just hoping somebody's going to come, you know, swoop in and save you, like forget about it. Yeah. In business and entrepreneurship that, uh, that's for damn sure. No one is coming to save you. You will have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to save yourself. There's no, there's no way. Martin, I got his phone number. I'll just call him. <laughs> he might be able to save me once in a while, but the other guys, I don't know, buddy. hundred percent. So, so Kyle, what, what would you say? Uh, what, what's like the biggest challenge that you're trying to overcome in your business right now to go to that next level? And I guess part two to that question is what is that next level? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say our next level is getting into more commercial accounts, like stuff that acquires you basically like a long term relationship with a company, um, you know, or an, an individual. And we're kind of we haven't dropped it yet, but we're doing some new containers that are lockable and closable and stuff like that. Something the industry really hasn't seen for our, our type trucks, at least. Um, so being able to integrate that and kind of push in to be like, hey, we're going to be your reliable waste management company from term here to term there. It gets more cash flow coming in. It gets more contracts. It gets more work. It's, it's a lot of where the bigger play is for the big companies like Waste Management Republic. A lot of the times you'll see them purchase the smaller companies that have contract based work. You know, that's essentially what they want is, you know, the agreements that they've already acquired with big companies and whatnot. So that's kind of our next move. Our biggest struggle right now, I would say, is just continuing to upsize and grow, getting more containers, equipment's expensive, you know, financing's expensive right now. So just kind of battling through that and, and being able to kind of crowdfund and get together enough money to basically keep everything going and doing what we normally do. And then also have that stash cash to be like, hey, we need to add X amount of containers or add an extra truck. Boom, let's do it. You know, so building those relationships with money people and banks and stuff like that as I get bigger in business and there's more expenses and more things going on. I think that's more where my headspace goes is like, hey, these big future moves, they require, you know, usually bigger dollars. So let's plan and prep for where are we going to get that and where is it going to make most sense for us so we don't delete all our cash flow trying to jump into a new venture. Yeah, hundred percent. That's always uh, it's always a challenge, you know. It's like investing, reinvesting that capital to keep growing the business, and it's like, oh gosh, what at what point can I actually take more of this out? But it's like, all right, keep rolling it back in, rolling it yeah. back in, right? <laughs> in my, I mean, junk rescue. I kind of look at it as like the godfather. I don't think it's the the last business I do. I think it's kind of a a starter to multiple businesses in the waste industry for us. And so for me. Um, you know, bigger companies like Waste Management Republic, Waste Connections, like we're more um, 
residential based or on demand service, not a lot of contracts, stuff like that. So there isn't a lot of interest in them buying us because we're not as like contract based. So I think the next move is kind of creating a, you know, a different business, a sub business or a sister business that's doing the bigger containers, you know, the um, actual lockable containers that can stay on commercial properties, you know, getting into the bigger scalable wrecking work that's where I look to see like the vision in the future, because then by that time I can take what I've learned from junk rescue, implementing those systems into the new business immediately, and then put something together where it's like, Hey, this is a three to six year play that we're going to try and sell to a bigger trash company, you know, like waste management or Republic. Love that. So, so is that, um, so you're, so why would, I guess, why wouldn't you just do that under junk rescue? And that's just like a division of, this company, I guess. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I could. It's a junk rescue is more like full service junk removal. Uh, the dumpster rentals that we offer are smaller containers. So um, it's more niche to like the residential space um, clientele. And that's why we integrated the e-commerce for like our small dumpster rentals. Because I noticed like when I would search or try and get a hold of like maybe these bigger companies for someone that just wanted a container for like the weekend or something simple. It's like a quick trash out at their, in their backyard or something. Dude, I need a container like today or tomorrow. It was a headache, you know, like you got to fill out a form with waste management, get a rep or this or that. And Hey, they're backed out. And there's just like a whole list of steps. I was like, Hey, just make it so they can put their credit card, get a dumpster today and like get it to their driveway. Like more junk rescue is, us serving the residential base and being able to be a quick, actable trash solution for them, where I think rebranding for something that's like more of a commercial route and like larger route, it would make more sense to just do a completely different, you know, business that's not attached to Junk Rescue and has a completely different model. Um, And Junk Rescue can kind of be that story that led me to the next step. Um, Because just with what we have now and our relationships in building residential, you know, work, it just, it doesn't mesh as well, but you know, I'll be talking to Cody more. Maybe he'll, he'll persuade me. Otherwise he'll say, Hey, you already got something going. Let's just do this and build on it. You know, I could be wrong, but it's one of those things where I just, for the purchasable, purchasable power from the bigger companies, it seems like uh, what I've noticed on trends is if you're going to go after that, you're going to want to get similar equipment to what those guys are using, similar colors, you know, similar systems, all that stuff. So kind of really duplicating what they're doing because it's an easy grab for them to go, okay, Hey, we'll, we'll take up what you kind of created over here. Um, and it, it's all together for us and that's nice. So see you later. And, and I've worked with plenty of companies that do it out here and then they just move to the next state, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's common in the waste industry, like waste management and Republic, they want to own all the accounts. And so as soon as a small guy comes in and starts to take up space, then, Oh, buy them. Yeah, they're just like, hey, this is an easy buy for them because I mean, with what they're making every year, they need to offset, you know, and they need to get more inventory and get more things and do that to avoid taxes and all that stuff. So it's easier probably for them to just acquire companies than go out and get new routes, you know. Hundred percent, and I mean, really, like from those private equity standpoint, the fastest way for them to grow is to buy the customers. Not, yeah. not actually market to them. Like if you could buy, and, yeah. and these are, you know, these private equity companies that they have growth requirements, right? Like most of them, they have to grow at minimum 30% a year is like what they're having to grow at. And most of them have, it's like three, five, seven, or 10 year capital windows where it's like, they have to place a certain amount of money within a certain amount of time. And then those companies that they do put together or buy in these, you know, packages, have to grow by 30% a year or more. And so obviously there's organic growth components to it, but then, you know, what's a better way to add 30% growth? Well, just go buy, you know, half a million in new revenue for the business. And even though you're paying a multiple, it's like, well, you're still adding customer growth. Yeah. The next day there's calls coming in there's yeah. things to do. There's bookings. I was talking to another business owner about this this morning. It's like, as I grow as an entrepreneur, I realize, like, dude, doing another business kind of seems like a headache, like just buying businesses seem like the way to go because then you can come in and clean them up and you already have cash flow. hopefully, you know, the day you buy it. So hundred percent. And that's, that's where I see him doing it. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's where we've, you know, we focused on, you know, doing that now over the last, you know, a little over a year and, 
really for that reason, you know, it's like, it's so much work to start something. It's so much easier once you have, you know, more capital available, or if you could raise it from other people to, you know, get into something where there's already existing cash flow and optimize it. And, you know, that's kind of the, you know, place where, you know, I've taken some minority positions in a couple of companies and, you know, kind of helping the entrepreneurs and those, you know, do the things they need to do to get it to the point where, you know, it's going to grow faster and, you know, to where, where they're wanting to see it go. But, you know, it's like, for me, I'm like, I don't think I ever want to start another business ever again. Besides there's, there's some things like, you know, I'm starting a nonprofit to help rescue dogs here in Arizona. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to buy a nonprofit. You know, it's like, I'm starting one. Cause it's just like, that's a thing I really want to do. And, you know, yeah. doing some of the, this branding, you know, stuff that I, I've needed to put more focus on, but I just haven't for a long time. There's so much in operating and running the companies and working in them. I just, you know, have it, yeah. but you know, so yeah. it's like, there's little things like that, that, you know, will put, put attention into, but you know, like you said, it's just, you could buy into a business that has cash flow and get it running. Um, and I think especially for, for individuals like yourself or myself, where it's, we have, you know, some track record of running a business that we can get into one and we're not going to like blow it up. Like the, the, the area where I worry about that is, you know, again, it's this whole freaking you know, in, you know, Instagram world of don't start a business, buy a business. And it's like, well, hopefully yeah. people are buying a business that they actually can do know how to do some stuff in. So they actually know what the heck they're doing. Cause you can yeah. also blow up a, a working business if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. That my, I think my model, and I'm sure you kind of with what you've already done is like buying sister businesses or stuff that maybe will help other businesses around yours or that you've gotten, you know, experience from, I think that's huge. And think of how much time you delete, like, company name, branding, you know, setting up all the, the website, the, the emails, like the, like staffing, like everything. Like if you kind of get a solid business and they're wanting to sell and you can purchase that. And even if you could get it on terms, like I'm sure you've done like even better Then it's like, okay, great. Now you can roll in and see like Cody knows like, Hey, these things right here, not good. Like let's switch those. And it's an easy little turn to where then you start to see better traction and roll and you can kind of coach and implement and put more systems opposed to like, all right, Hey, we're starting scratch, you know? So, yeah. but there are, like you said earlier, where like the Instagram, like, Hey, everyone, you know, buy a business, you still need businesses to be started so that they can be purchased later by someone or sold, you know? And a lot of, you know, even with me with this, this was just a outside of high school thing that it's like, all right, Hey, let's create a home service business and, you know, grind and do our best where now as I grow as an entrepreneur, it's like, how can we, you know, acquire more companies and sell them and, you know, really morph into my mature entrepreneurship state to where it's like, that's what I like. That's what I get a high off of. And that's, what's cool to me. Um, actually like running the business and doing the day to day is fun and it's cool, but I like more, you know, that side of the game, you know, really like you're getting after, Hey, what can we do to develop this and grow this and turn it and put it on the map? And then, okay, what's next? You know, it just creates more of like, um, just a fire, you know, it's just puts, yeah. puts that bug in you. It's fun. You know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely a, a deal junkie for sure. I like, I oh, like yeah. working on, on deals. Oh, you <laughs> coming from real estate and wholesale, you're freaking deal junkie forever, baby. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it, it makes it, it makes it super fun. Um, you got to keep up with your boy pace too. He's buying a deal every second. You got to watch out for that guy. <laughs> for He's real. He's a madman. He, he could do, he could just, talk anybody into buying on terms. I love it. I love watching his stuff. Like I got a lot right next to um, ours where we store our containers and I bought it on terms based on like watching you and pace and stuff. Like I ran into the neighbor and I said, Hey, if you ever want to sell that lot, just let me know. I'm right next door. You know, we, we need more space for our dumpsters and trucks. So be a good one for us. I don't know if you're interested in selling, but figured I'd put that out there. And then boom, you know, he sends me a text six months later. Hey, do you still want to you know, buy that. And I'm like, absolutely I would, but if you can do it on terms and he's like, yeah, I can do it on terms. So then it just turned into that. And it's like stuff like that, where even real estate and like, even if you own a business or you do other things that have income, like for me, I'm always kind of stashing money to be able to put that into a working cash flow, something that can generate more money for me. And I can leverage it later, pull, pull debt on it or sell it or whatever that is. Um, that's kind of my play inside my current business is like, stash the money, you know, use it for what you need it, but have some there for like when Cody calls and says, Hey, I got a really good deal. 
you can throw that in there and it, it'll help you generate more because then you're not, you know, breaking your back for the rest of your life. You're wanting to do assets. I mean, I've had a guy, you know, that's going to come up on some money here shortly. And he's like, gosh, I, I want to get this car. And I was like, before you go get the car, dude, I was like, let's get you a condo. Let's get you a house. Let's get you something that's going to produce you cash flow that you can leverage. And eventually then you can go get that fancy car, but get those things first because you can always just, once the car's there, it's like, it's really no value. And then it just goes away or you keep it forever or whatever. But it, if you get those assets and those things that are cash flowing, and it makes it, I think a lot more enjoyable to have something fancy and cool like that. And you know, like, Hey, I have stuff paying for it. You know, this is coming from outside ventures or real estate or something that is cash flowing for me that, you know, helps me pay the note on this or just pay it cash, you know, and you don't have to deal with that liability sitting over your head. Yeah, hundred percent. I I'm, I'm big on the, you know, the, the personal money management side. So important, you know, it's like your business can make, you know, tons of money, but it's like, well, what are you doing with the money? It's like, what are, are you investing it? Are you putting it into assets? And you know, yeah. that had been most of my focus, like literally my entire twenties. And I turned 32 months ago and you know, I'm, I, I, I have the rewards from that of just like dumping things just into investments. And, you know, yeah. I, my personal lifestyle is covered more than like 100% plus plus on just investment income. And so it's like all of the upside of business is just gravy and like these opportunities, yes. you know, but it's like, that doesn't, again, like that wasn't in 17 minutes for those Instagram people, you know, Dude, it was I watched, I watched Cody <laughs> cold calling with Jack and like, he didn't have nothing. You were just like in a little condo or something like Jack was like, yeah. And that's the thing is you put your head down and you're like, Hey, I'm going to acquire, I'm going to get stuff that, you know, and then eventually you're like, Hey, I have enough. I can get the things I want and enjoy, but I bet you feel a lot more fulfilled having those knowing, Hey, they're covered and pipe. The pipeline is full of cash flow coming in from these assets opposed to like just getting on a load of money and being like, Oh shit. Like I'm just going to go buy that shit. And then you're like, well now I just have this and it doesn't produce anything for me. So you know, it's, it's a total different play. And I think it becomes with age and maturity, like you were young and, and realized that early. So you're like, Hey, if I do this now, just put my head down, I can still be, you know, well off in thirties and forties and have fun and not need to like, you know, people do that where they're like hoarding their money or they're like putting it in stuff and they're like super cheap. And I'm like, I know you have like some money to maybe like, you know, have some fun or do something. And then I always ask those people like, what is your plans with it? Like you're going to die one day, right? Like, do yeah. you want to leave it for everyone or like, you're going to spend it or what? And it's like, Oh no, I'm going to leave it to my kids or this or that. And I'm like, dude, your kids want to be fulfilled and do their own thing too. Like they're not just waiting. I mean, maybe some kids are like, Hey, I'm waiting for that like big old check or whatever. But yeah. it's like, Hey, you know, if you can grind and get after it, go do it. And then, you know, don't rely on something like that and, and utilize your funds when it makes sense. Like in your position where you're like, Hey, feel comfortable. I can do some things. I'm going to do it. And then you go from there, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. Like the, you know, I always, and like, uh, there's definitely a large amount of people that kind of disagree with it, but you know, I, because I think it's just because it's not fun and people don't enjoy it. And it's like, you know, it's not something that's going to get a bunch of clicks of excitement from people. But like, I was like, how could I keep my personal living expenses as cheap as possible and, and to be able to dump as much into investing into my future as possible for a short period of time? Because, you know, after a few years of doing that, you got a bunch of compounding interest and momentum and things going. And that was always my thing. I'm like, the faster I do this, the faster I'm going to, you know, yes. get to, you know, where I want to be. And, you know, it's like I... Uh, you know, like you're talking about the cold calling. It's like I, I house hacked, you know, the condo I lived in. Then I moved into, you know, a really good investment property, sub two property that, you know, was really like literally a thousand dollar a month mortgage. And yeah. I could have been, you know, like a lot of friends, I could have been living in a three, four, five thousand dollar a month, you know, luxury yeah. apartment. But I'm like, no, this is allowing me to dump that additional cash into more investments and roll it forward, roll it forward. And then it's just like after a period of time, you know, it's like it compounds. And I think, 
you know, I think a lot of people just, again, they want it too fast. They want to have the nice things or, you know, it's like, yeah, I have nice cars now, but, you know, I've paid cash for them because I waited and I, you know, withheld to make sure in, and not in people have different opinions on, you know, whether you should, you know, pay your cars off or not. They're like, well, you could arbitrage the interest and instead of 4% get sick. And I'm like, I just yeah. don't like having a payment on my car. So I just don't yeah, want don't it. Want yeah, you don't want to deal with like logging in and having to pay it and then see the note and deal with, and especially if you had solidified those funds there for that, then you're yeah. like, you know, and it, with the supercars and stuff like that, I'm sure it's like, maybe there's a few that you might keep in the collection, but most of them you're usually flipping and turning around where you're like, Hey, I want to try that one next. So yeah. now it makes it easier to sell. You have, you're like, Hey, I got the title. Yeah. Like, let's just do the work. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's plays with everything. I think just in business until you start kind of getting cash flow and money to hoard, then, then you can decide like, all right. Cause that was my thing. I was like three years in the CPA called and was like, Hey, you're going to owe like a significant amount in taxes. Like, and I'm like still new to this and I'm like, okay, well, what can we do? And she was like, well, you could get another truck. It's perfect. Let's get another truck, you know? So like stuff like that to where like, I'm a big believer. Some people are different in leveraging trying to expense as much as I can through the business so that it, sure. you know, it doesn't help you with loans and stuff like that, obviously, but it doesn't look like you're the richest guy on the planet to the guy you give your, you know, uh, K ones to and all that yeah. stuff. But it's like, Hey, you know, you can, it, it's your American duty to leverage that and pay as little taxes. <laughs> That's my thing. So I've done that over the seven years and yeah. be able to put money back into my business and help the economy. I'm buying equipment, you know, I'm buying stuff that's going to help produce for the economy and, and help people with their services and what they need to do and get done and tasks. So that's the way I look at it. And until like, I guess my point is, yeah, until you have some money stashed where you're like, Hey, I can really do something with this. Then that's when you want to start getting a little bit more creative outside of your business to where, Hey, where can I take some of that for it to work for me to cash flow and, and build assets as, as you grow? Yeah, I love that. So um, as, as we're coming up on the, the last couple of minutes here, Kyle, what, what would you, uh, any, you know, any books that you would recommend or, or things that you had, you know, learned or studied that helped you on like that, that path from like solopreneur to now where, you know, your business is doing a million plus a year and, you know, you have this team, you know, anything that you'd recommend that was just like a standout, you know, helpful thing for you, or maybe if it was, I don't know, certain videos on YouTube, or if it was a certain book or certain, like any education that you went through that, you know, for self self-development that you think would help. Yeah, I'm not the biggest reader. I do when I do my 75 hards, like I try and yeah. throw those in when I can. And, and Jack and I think Zach are doing one right now. And so it's one of those things where I read during that era. But like when I have my free time, I'm terrible about it. So I don't have like any awesome books that I like reference to. I would just say for me is like relationships, trial and error, and basically being able to like, you know, hey, foster a relationship. And with when it's with inside your business, like kind of decide like, all right, hey, what is a relationship that's really key that's going to keep getting reoccurring sales for us or something that's going to be a longevity for the business? That was always my kind of thing is like, hey, even if you're not the best at that, like and you're the owner and you're still kind of starting and doing get out there, shake the hands, maybe learn like who you like to work with, who you don't like to work with, and then kind of just learning those things as you go in the business, like physically doing it is the only way that you're going to learn like, Hey, this is a way we could do it faster and better, um, for the team and scale it, you know, at a, at a maximal level. So for me, it's just, I think being really hands-on, there wasn't anything like magical that I read or like saw online. Um, another thing I would throw in, it's not for everybody, but the more I put my face out there and, and reached out to people and said, Hey, you know, could you help me promote my brand or my business or, Hey, I'm just going to start doing a lot of videos on Instagram and tell our story of like what we do, you know, that helped create a lot more attention and get more people into our realm of, you know, the waste management space and connect us with people like, Oh, you're the Kyle guy. I've seen you. And it's like, it kind of gives an impression opposed to them not knowing who you are to begin with. So you kind of break that barrier of like, uh, who are you and who are you, especially when you're trying to maybe create a relationship with like a bigger company or someone that you want to do business with is like, put your face out there, you know, show people what you do. Don't be scared. Kind of like back to real estate. Don't be a secret agent, you know, stuff like that, you know, you know, get out of your shell. You know, not everyone's is outgoing and want to be on camera and talk. And I get that, but 
being able to get out of your shell and show people you're confident and you can deliver, I think is going to, you know, help you tremendously. Like the, the readings and the videos, yeah, they're good motivation. And I think it gives you perspective of like, Hey, that's, that's doable. I can do that. You know, someone else did it so I can model it and do it. But really getting out there, taking the action is, is my advice. Love that. And you know, it's, it's a not, uh, you know, people talk about, it's like manifesting your, your goals and dreams or, you know, the, uh, you know, your the, like that whole like woo woo stuff. And it's like, sometimes yeah. it's just like, you just got to go and take the action and, you know, learn and, and then having those learnings, like we talked about of like, okay, d- learn, do the thing, pivot with, you know, what worked, what didn't work, do more yeah. of what worked and, you know, just keep, keep building upon it. And I know you're a believer in that too, with the manifestation and like being able to like, it's a common core of both, like of of being able to like, Hey, um, you know, I see this, I visualize it. Okay. Put the action with it. So it kind of blends together and you will start to see like, Hey, my manifestations, like they work, like it actually happens. Like you definitely have to be able to close your eyes and picture yourself doing it and believe in yourself. Because if you don't, then it's, it's really not going to work. You want, you're going to have to motivate yourself to get up every day, do what you need to do to push yourself forward and the business. But having both, I think is crucial. Like I've done it plenty of times where I'm like, Ooh, I see that. Like, and I'll just put it out in the universe, you know, and just kind of talk about it and put it out there. And then, then you start to kind of implement it and you're like, Oh shit, like this is actually happening now. But I think if you didn't put that in the universe, it maybe never would aspire to something. So having the confidence and the grit to, you know, do it is, is key. Definitely the, uh, uh, you know, backing up the action with it, but you know, I am, I'm a big believer and, you know, it's like, we get to design our lives. We get to design what it looks like and we get to make our own story. And, you know, it's, it's coming from that place of like, like you said, it's like being able to visualize like what you want and then just taking action along the way towards, you know, getting to that visualization. Um, you know, but you gotta, the the work part has to happen. You can't just, you know, marinate on it all the time. (laughs) You can't marinate and just kind of keep talking about it. And it's like anything, like we talked about earlier, like there's stuff you're not going to want to do, you know, and it's like in life with anything, like, you know, for me, I like working out. Like some people are like, Oh, I hate it, but I got to do it because, you know, I just, you know, I want to stay in shape and stuff like that. But it's being able to kind of set boundaries, you know, set, set, you know, boundaries with yourself and be able to like put things, you know, on your note sheet and accomplish them, you know, put, help hold yourself accountable, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah. I love it. I love it. So, uh, you know, as, as we wrap up here, Kyle, you know, where, where can people go to find you, whether it's social medias or, um, anywhere online, obviously we'll, you know, put in the show notes, your, um, yeah. information, but anywhere that you want people to go to find you. Yeah, well, our most common is Instagram at Junk Rescue AZ. Um, you can go to our website, junkrescueaz.com. There's a bunch of information on there, whether if you want to, you know, utilize the service or if you want to get into the industry and learn more about it. Um, we're going to be integrating with like a couple um, uh, manufacturers that help us with our equipment and stuff like that very sh- soon. So you will see a lot more content on YouTube and a lot more education about like the actual space. So stay tuned for that same, um, handle at junk rescue AZ, but yeah, I appreciate you having me on Cody and being able to kind of share my story and hopefully other entrepreneurs listen to this and, you know, get a little tick out of it and it it helps them, you know, move to the next level in their business. That's what it's really all about. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much, Kyle. Yeah. I appreciate you, Cody. Thank you.